Hi, and welcome back. Um, we're going to lace into constant speed propellers and governors today. Now, um, this is applicable to a lot of different things. The, the systems that you're going to learn here are similar to many other systems out there. For instance, the, uh, the governor that controls a typical constant speed propeller on a general aviation aircraft is not only similar to the governor that, uh, that controls propellers on big turboprops, but is also similar to a lot of fuel control units. For instance, the, uh, the Allison uh, C-20 um, uh, that is in a typical jet ranger or something like that has something that's very, very similar to this. So by learning this, you're not only learning about constant speed propeller systems, but also about um, uh, other systems out there as well. So with that in mind, um, we're going to start with talking about the propeller itself here. Um, the reason we do this is it makes it more efficient over a wide range of airspeeds. Last time in fixed pitch um, props, we talked about the fact that you have to either pick climb, pick cruise, or pick some, some, some sort of a compromise between the two. And uh, uh, what the constant speed allows us to do is have whatever type of prop we need at the moment uh, from one moment to the next and, and be uh, uh, much more efficient that way. It also allows us to, to operate the engine at a specific desired RPM. So higher RPM when power is needed and lower RPM when it's not and we would prefer to get a little bit of our fuel economy. Um, in order for this to work, it requires a device for monitoring the RPM and controlling the pitch of the propeller. And so the blades on the propeller are twistable. They're, they're, um, they've got a uh, bearing uh, in at the hub and the pitch is changeable in flight. Um, but we need a governor to do that for us. Um, these are hydraulically controlled. There's a piston, believe it or not, out there in the spinner. Um, in, in the prop hub and uh, when we pump um, uh, oil, we use engine oil as the hydraulic fluid for, the, for this control system, we pump engine oil out into there, it changes the pitch of the, uh, of the propeller. Um, when we get into the classroom for this session, I'll be able to put a cutaway of this right in front of you so you can see how it works. We're going to start off talking about non-feathering propellers. Um, so this would be something we would find on a single-engine aircraft. And, and the reason we use non-feathering on single-engine aircraft is that if we have an engine failure on a single-engine aircraft, we would prefer that the propeller continue to turn the engine so that if we fix something, for instance, enrich in the mixture or pull the carb heat or whatever, um, the engine's already turning, we don't have to hit the starter, it'll immediately start running again for us. Whereas on a multi-engine aircraft, we would prefer to feather uh, the engine and get it stopped so it's not creating any drag because we have another engine that we can continue on with, um, not so with a single engine. Um, so oil pressure in this situation, a non-feathering propeller, the oil pressure from the governor increases the pitch which decreases the RPM. So without the oil it would go to high RPM and that's an important thing to remember from a pilot point of view is that if the governor fails or you run out of oil um, it's going to go to high RPM. Um, the governor is driven by the engine and it's typically mounted up at the front end of the engine up where the near where the uh, crankshaft comes out and attaches to the propeller. Um, and it's usually hanging on the side of the engine. Um, it looks about the size of uh, a largish beer can. Uh, and uh, it's driven by the engine with an internal uh, gear that goes inside the engine. Um, there's a set of flyweights inside that are used to sense the RPM. We'll talk more about those in a second. Um, and it uses engine oils. And, then, and it's just using the oil as a hydraulic fluid. And the nice thing about doing that is it's nice and warm and, uh, and, and so it's not going to uh, solidify out there in that cold propeller hub. Um, it incorporates an internal pump to boost the oil pressure because just engine oil wouldn't be high enough. Oil is directed as needed to maintain RPM. So more oil is directed uh, when we need to increase pitch. 
which decreases RPM, or we allow oil to escape back into the engine um, if we want to decrease pitch, which increases RPM. So I've made sort of a con cartoon diagram of how this thing works. The speeder spring, or the uh, flyweights, excuse me, up at the top in purple here, are spinning. And they are spinning proportional to the speed of the engine. So the faster the engine spins, the faster these, these flyweights spin. Um, the flyweights are hinged here, where the black dot is. And so if the engine starts spinning faster, the flyweights will tend to fly out. Um, and that means that the toe of the flyweight pushes up against this yellow speeder spring here. And that's what it's really called is a speeder spring. Um, the toes also lift up on the pilot valve. And uh, the pilot valve opens or closes uh, passageways to, to direct high, oil, high pressure oil out to the propeller hub or allow oil to escape from the propeller, propeller hub back to the oil sump. And then at the bottom here is our oil boost pump. So we take oil from the from at engine oil to, uh, pressure, we put it in the pump, and it boosts it up to a higher pressure, something around the 125 psi range. So let's watch how this works in real life, or well, a cartoon version of real life anyway. So here is what we call an overspeed condition. The engine is turning too fast, and so the flyweights have have thrown out. That lifts up on the speeder spring, so the, the, they've overcome the force that we've put on it with the speeder spring. The, uh, that allows high pressure oil to go out to the hub. That increases the pitch of the blades, which decreases RPM to bring it back to the on speed condition. Now what is on speed? Well that's what we, the pilot, get to decide. And we do that by adjusting a propeller control, a separate knob that you push or pull in the cockpit. Um, and it applies either more or less pressure to the speeder spring. The more pressure we put on the speeder spring, the more speed it takes to be in the on-speed condition. So what about an under-speed condition? Now we've let the, R the engine is, has bogged down because maybe we've reduced our air speed. And so the flyweights are pushed in by the, the force of the speeder spring. That pushes the pilot valve out. And that opens up that channel to, for the oil that's out in the hub to be pushed back into the engine sump. That decreases the pitch, which increases the RPM until we get back to our on-speed condition. So pretty elegant little solution. Um, in actual fact, it doesn't look exactly like this, but the thing to remember here is that when you move the propeller control in the cockpit, you're controlling the pressure on that speeder spring. A feathering propeller um, is used on multi-engine airplanes, and some counterweights are added to the blades to make them want to increase pitch instead of decrease pitch. Um, oil pressure from the governor decreases the pitch. So we, we hook it up kind of backwards. So we, we put, in the case of a feathering propeller like in the Seminole, um, we send oil out to decrease the pitch, and if there's no oil pressure, the propellers will automatically go to feather, which stops the engine from turning. Um, feathering latches keep the propellers from feathering every time you shut down because if the propellers feathered every time you shut down, it would make the engine really hard to start. Um, feathering latches will typically engage at about 900 RPM. That's an important uh, pilot thing uh, because if, you, if your engine really is failing um, and making a bunch of bad noises, you need to move the propeller control to the feather position before you get down below 900 RPM uh, because otherwise it won't feather. It'll get stuck and then it's causing a lot of unnecessary drag. Unfeathering requires engine uh, restart or an oil pressure accumulator. It's worth noting that um, it's not just uh, the counterweights here. Um, there are other ways of, of overcoming the propeller's natural tendency to want to to go to a lower pitch. Um, so in addition to counterweights, there's also often pressurized nitrogen 
um, out in the propeller hub to, to push it towards low pitch, or excuse me, towards high pitch, um, low RPM, towards the feather position, and also a big spring. The seminal, the propeller in the seminal has both of those things, high pressure nitrogen and a spring out in the propeller hub to overcome the propeller's natural tendencies. Here's a little uh, uh, picture of what a feathering latch looks like. Um, and uh, uh, it's not super important to know what it looks like, but um, uh, you can read more about them there in Chapter 7 of your textbook. Here's a more accurate drawing of what a governor actually looks like. Um, and, uh, and you can see it's just a little bit more complicated in terms of the passageways, but in fact it actually is exactly like that cartoon version that I looked at. We'll start here with the on-speed condition. Uh, in uh, some, some diagrams you'll see some little numbers by each of these little plugs here. And, and what that indicates is that you can actually screw those plugs in and out to change the function of these uh, uh, passageways. Um, to change it from a feathering governor to an unfeather uh, non-feathering governor. Um, you don't need to worry about that right now. It's just kind of an interesting little fact. But uh, the way this works is it comes in here at the bottom, goes through the pressure boost pump. You can sort of see the gear pump down there represented. So we have higher pressure oil up in here. And it goes up to the pilot tube, which is this rod that goes uh, up and down here. Um, and uh, and then we have the uh, fly weights and the speeder spring up at the top and in this case you can actually see the linkage that the control is attached to that you move in the cockpit. Uh, if we go to an overspeed you can see that the fly weights have moved out um, and now the uh, the pilot tube moves and that's one thing that uh, but uh, but it does show that um, we've we've got now oil moving from the propeller control line back, th follow the arrows, and it goes back to the uh, the engine sump. Um, and then here is a governor in an underspeed condition. Um, and once again, you can see the flyweights. Once again, I'm going to have one of these in class that's actually cut away that you can um, hold in your hand and you can push out on the little flyweights and all that stuff. So you'll be able to get a close-up look at it. It's not important to be able to trace out the actual channels in this. and It's actually not very revealing f from a pilot point of view or an understanding of how these work. What it is important to know is whether your system uses the high pressure oil to increase pitch or decrease pitch. If, chances are if you've got a single engine airplane, the high pressure oil is going to be used to increase pitch or decrease RPM. And if you've got a twin engine aircraft, the high pressure oil is going to be used to decrease pitch or increase RPM. Propeller synchronization. Um, often in light twins, it's something that we have to do manually, and there's there's often some little um, tools within the cockpit to help you get it done very precisely. Um, you can also have automatic systems where where this the system sync, senses RPM on one engine, and then sends some uh, signals to the other engine via a little DC motor to to change the uh, uh, the pitch on the other engine so that it matches exactly. Synchronization is really important. Um, uh, if you're not synchronized, you'll you'll hear this wah 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 sound, which is super annoying. But it also uh, sets up harmonic vibrations that can work harden the the airframe and ca eventually cause cracks. Um, it also will cause your flight instructor to to uh, to whack you across the lap with your seatbelt, so so you need to make sure you get that synchronized. Um, propeller or uh, anti or de ice. Um, the propeller also needs to have icing protection on it if you're going to go into known icing. And so we have anti or de ice systems. Anti ice systems means that you should be using this system prior to icing. Typically this is the case with a uh, fluid type system where you've got glycol or some version of that that 
gets dripped out onto the leading edge of the uh, propeller and uh, and it keeps the ice from sticking to the front of the propeller. There's often a little pad of grooved rubber glued on to the uh, leading edge of the about the first third of the propeller to help guide the anti-ice fluid out onto the blade. Once you get past about the first third or half of the of the propeller blade, you don't worry about ice so much because the, the blade is too sharp and moving too fast to accrete ice. But the the, the towards the hub where it's thicker and moving slower, they can uh, accrete quite a bit of ice. De-ice systems um, can and should be used after a little bit of ice has been accumulated and, and uh, electric heater is, is common for this one and those can come in the form of a little rubber uh, mat um, that has electric elements in it that gets glued to the leading edge. Pre-flighting propellers, um, if you're gonna, when you pre-flight a fixed pitch, we talked about the importance of checking for nicks and de dents, and also you'd want to look at the shape of the tip, especially if you're approaching an airplane in a company that you've never dealt with before. Um, sometimes they're a little bit overzealous with trying to get every last hour out of their propellers, so you want to make sure that it looks like a propeller still. Um, co on constant speed, you do that, plus you check for leaks down at the hub. Um, so there shouldn't be any oil coming out. Um, when you first assemble a constant speed prop, like right, they, they have to be uh, overhauled about every 300 hours or so. Um, and so when you first assemble it, there's some assembly grease that all, often works out and it's sort of a sticky uh, grease that you'll find little streaks on the, the blade. But that should end fairly quickly after overhaul and there should never be any of the darker engine oil out there. Um, there should also never be any slop between the blade and the hub. Um, also, it's quite often possible to reach inside the cooling air inlet just behind the propeller and see the governor and control cable. And if you can see it and touch it, just make sure that it's secure in there and, and nothing has come loose. On the anti or DI system, um, check the condition and the security. And above all, if it's a uh, liquid type system, check the level of the fluid. When you're handling propellers, it's really important to remember that that magneto, um, its natural state is to be on. And so everything attached to it has to be functioning perfectly in order for it to turn off. Um, so always assume that the magneto is hot. Try not to handle the propeller unless it's necessary, but it often is. Turn backwards um, unless it's prohibited by your engine type, and, and I think this is HAA's preferred way. Um, what that does for you is it keeps the uh, impulse couplers from engaging which make a uh, inadvertent engine firing less likely. Uh, turn it slowly and above all just keep all the body parts that you actually value out of the prop arc so if it does fire you don't lose anything you care about. Um, consider using a tow bar rather than pulling on the propeller, and I think HAA does a pretty good job. Their SOPs um, uh, have you handling the aircraft in a pretty safe manner out there. Um, if you're dealing with a bigger aircraft and you need to move the propeller because it's in the way of the of the tow bar or whatever, um, you may consider uh, tapping on the starter just a little bit to move it out of the way. Push or pull as close as possible to the hub. Um, don't pull out on the tips of the propeller because with, with no centrifugal force to keep the blade straight, there it's possible to actually bend them slightly and then you're going to get a vibration. Um, also don't push on the spinner though. The spinner is made of fairly lightweight aluminum and so if you push and pull on that it puts too much stress on the little screw holes and you'll end up with a bunch of cracks. The spinner and the spinner bulkhead, which is what the spinner screws onto behind the propeller, um, are surprisingly expensive. The last time I bought a set for just a 150 it was it was over $800 for the pair, so take good care of those things. Operation of a constant speed. So um, first rule is easy does it. Nice, slow control inputs and, and you know given that we're dealing with flyweights and, and sending oil out into a cylinder that has to get filled up, 
um, there's bound to be a little bit of lag. So if you make abrupt throttle changes, um, the governor won't keep up and you'll, you'll end up with an overspeed. So nice, easy, smooth movements. Um, modern cockpits are set up so that if you're doing a power reduction, you start on the left and move right through the controls. Um, and if and what so typically on the left is the carb heat and then the throttle, the prop, the mixture, and the cow flaps. Um, and then if you're increasing power, you start with the cow flaps, then the mixture, the prop, the throttle, and then, then finally the carb heat. The reason you do it that way is is so that you don't increase the manifold pressure drastically before you increase the RPM. Um, and there's two things that can go wrong there. One is um, it can get you in a situation where you that can lead to detonation, which we'll top, talk more about in power management. Um, and that's where the fuel explodes rather than burning, and it's otherwise known as pinging. And that can be very damaging to the engine. And then the other thing is if you've got a situation where you have high manifold pressure um, and then you you move the... Uh, the propeller control forward to higher RPM, there's a real tendency for it to overshoot. And again, you can end up with an overspeed there. So um, if you move left to right for reductions and right to left for increasing power, then you should be good to go. So here's what it looks like with another cartoon here with our shaky handed pilot. Um, here we are sitting on the air, uh, runway ready for takeoff. And you can see we have the carb heat in, the propeller and the mixture controls are full forward. Um, we're at an idle. Um, the cow flaps are open. We're ready for takeoff. So we're going to smoothly increase the power to full, um, accelerate down the runway, rotate, get the gear cl cleaned up and the flaps and all that stuff if we have it. And when we get up there to 500 or 1,000 feet, we need to do a power reduction down to climb settings. Climb settings are typically indicated by the top of the green arc on the manifold pressure and RPM gauges. Um, so this is a power reduction. Um, so we're going to start on the left and move right. We don't need carb heat because we're just coming back to uh, a climb setting. So um, should be plenty of heat in there. Um, but we're going to reduce the throttle uh, down to just below what we want. And the reason we go just below is because when we now adjust the RPM, to less, that's less revolutions happening, less demand for fuel air mixture. And so the what you'll find is when you reduce the RPM, the manifold pressure creeps up about one inch. Uh, so we set the throttle a little bit lower than we want, then we bring the prop down to the top of the green. Um, the manifold pressure comes up right up to the top of the green. Lean the mixture if it's appropriate, um, depends on the aircraft, whether you do that for a climb. And typically on a climb, we leave the cow flaps open. Now we get up there to our cruising altitude, and we have to reduce power again. And once again, we don't really need carb heat yet. We're going to bring the throttle down just below where we want it for the cruise. We're going to set the RPM for cruise, which brings the manifold pressure right up to where we want it. And we're going to lean as specified in the pilot operating handbook for crews. Uh, and we're going to open the cow flaps so that, um, or excuse me, close the cow flaps so there's not as much cooling air going through the engine. Okay, now we've decided we want to climb again. So this time we're going to start on the right and open up the cow flaps, enrich in the mixture a little bit increase the uh, uh, the RPM to the top of the green um, uh, and then increase the manifold pressure to the climb setting. Don't need to do anything with carb heat this time. Now we're going to do a rapid descent uh, for some reason. Maybe we're on a non-precision approach or we just need to get down fast. Well we're going to bring the carb heat on this time. We're going to reduce the thr throttle way down to something low. We're going to put the prop full in and the reason we're doing that is because now we're in a situation where the oncoming air is actually turning the propeller and so the propeller is is creating drag and the faster we spin it with the air that's coming over it um, the more drag it produces so pushing the prop all the way in will actually create drag and help you descend faster and the mixture we're going to leave where it is but boy do we ever want those cow flaps closed uh, for this operation Above all, 
Minds like lightning, hands like molasses. So think about what you're doing first, and then nice and smooth and easy make your adjustments. And never move a lever, switch, or knob without thinking about it first. We just don't do that as professional pilots. That's it, and next time we will cover um, rotor blades and propeller governors.